following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. As people who are interested in meditation, we want serenity. In most cases, when someone's attracted to studying meditation or spirituality, it's because some suffering afflicts them and they want relief. And meditation is a known solution. It is a proven science that directly changes our suffering and gives us an opportunity to discover what serenity really is. But it is a scientific process based in facts. Serenity is not something that is given as a gift. It isn't something that we receive from the gods. It is also not something that can be bought. And if you've had some experience in this world, you may have encountered very poor people, very rich people, and you may have seen for yourself that serenity escapes them all. Wealth does not solve the problems of suffering or discontentment. But you can find poor people and rich people who are equally unhappy. You can also find them who are equally content. The difference between them is not their material possessions or their social status. It is their attitude. That's the difference. And that attitude is really significant in spirituality. It's really significant when we want to understand and experience what serenity is. When we use this word serenity, we're using it in a very technical way. We're describing a very specific state of mind, a state of being, something that one experiences and lives. It is not elusive, and it is not in the future or the past. It's something that is known in the present. Serenity, as a technical term in this tradition, refers to a mind that is at peace, that is stable, that is calm, that is not in chaos or surging with thoughts and emotions and cravings fears. What I placed here as an image to illustrate this is a map of our five centers. We also call it the three brains. These are psychological tools, machines that we are experiencing all the time, but we're not really that aware of them. We don't really pay that much attention to them. But the energy that passes through them is what determines our experience of living in the moment. So the state of the energy that's flowing through the intellect is what we experience as mind, thought. Most of the time, that state of mind, state of thought, is out of our control. It is a chaos of a constant movement of thinking, of voices, over which we seem to have no control. And anyone who's tried to learn to meditate knows this for a fact. 
that your instructor tells you, sit, empty your mind of thoughts, and you can't. Because you sit and the thoughts just keep happening. That is a lack of serenity. There's also a state of mind or intellect that we can call dullness or laxity. And this is a state in which the mind is very dark, dull, heavy, like molasses, like mud, something thick, impenetrable. And we can also experience that in our daily lives or in our attempts to meditate when our mind just seems sluggish. Usually when we feel that, we run for the coffee or we run to bed. So there are these extremes of excitement, agitation, stress, high energy, to the other extreme of dullness, a state of obscurity. You see this pendulum in our intellect, in our thought process, between these extremes, these movements that we don't seem to have any control over. That same pendulum happens in the other centers. Emotionally, it happens as well, but we're even less aware of that where we get emotionally excited, we get emotionally attracted, emotionally interested, emotionally wound up. That includes stress. That includes anxiety, fear. It includes lust. It includes all forms of desires where we become very fixated on something and our emotional craving and urge to have that is overwhelming. And at the same time, we can experience states in which our emotional center feels numb, dead, cold, where something happens that's awful, tragic, and we don't feel anything, or something happens that's great and wonderful, and we don't feel anything. There's these extreme movements in the same way in the emotional center, excitement and laxity, these big shifts, again, that we seem to have no control over and that don't seem to have any real correspondence to the reality. We can go to a party, everybody's happy, but we're depressed, we're miserable. We may not even know why, we just feel bad. Everyone experience that sort of thing? Where your inner state does not match your external circumstances. Same thing, more subtle, in the third brain or these other three centers, the motor, instinctual, and sexual centers. These are much more rapid, much more difficult to be aware of because they're so subtle and so deep inside the psyche. But we find the same fundamental pendulum between excitement and laxity, agitation and dullness. The essential point is that all of that chaos that we experience psychologically, that we think is life, that we think is normal, is not normal. It is not really living. It is reacting. And it is being in a cage, psychological cage, over which we have no control. Things happen and reactions are constantly flaring up in these centers within us. And all we're doing all the time is trying to contain it. Trying even to run from it, to mask it, to hide it. Life is happening. Painful things, difficult things. We have anxiety, stress, uncertainty. We have goals, but we can't achieve them. We have problems and we can't solve them. Things are happening constantly. And within us are flaring all kinds of reactions all the time that we can't deal with. We don't know how. And as a result, the body, the heart, and the mind suffer. And we have this extreme state of agitation that these days is becoming more acute, becoming worse. And that's why we see people finding things to use as band-aids that they become addicted to. Alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, sex, money power, distractions. People binge watch TV. They binge on food. 
They binge on all types of sensations to indulge themselves in those sensations as a way of avoiding what's happening in their minds and hearts and bodies. This is why society is cracking apart. No one is equipped with the specific understanding of how to transform this state of being and be serene. And we study religion and we see that the prophets and saints knew how to do it. In the midst of their incredible trials, they maintained love and compassion and patience and tolerance and great diligence to work on behalf of others. In spite of being tortured, persecuted, ridiculed, gossiped about, none of those things affected them. They may have been impoverished, starving, in the wilderness, but yet maintained a loving attitude even towards their persecutors. That is spirituality. That ability to remain serene no matter what. And that serenity is not an external factor. It is not a gift from the gods. It is not something fake. It cannot be faked. The reality is that serenity is the natural state of your being. Your being. Its natural state, unmodified, unconditioned, is serenity. That's inside of you. It's already there. We all have that. The process of learning to meditate is the process of learning to transform our responses to stimuli, both internal and external. To learn to perceive in a real way and not respond mechanically and automatically due to anger or fear or lust or greed or gluttony or envy or any of those other qualities, but to instead rely on the natural and true state of our inner being, which is serenity, love, altruism, patience, diligence, those types of qualities that we all have inside. What I'm pointing out is a fundamental difference in attitude. Most people who come seeking meditation want a Band-Aid. They want to be given a quick fix. Do this practice, take this drug, buy this machine, go to this workshop and spend thousands of dollars and we will give you the key to happiness. That's what people say and people believe. That's all lies. It's all lies. The reality is serenity is already in you. It is the natural state of your consciousness. All you have to do is transform your moment to moment way of, of dealing with things. It's a shift in attitude. Instead of chasing after serenity, you look for the things that prevent it and you change how you respond to them. That simple action lets serenity emerge on its own. It lets serenity become our natural state. It's quite simple. It takes work. It's a simple thing, but it isn't an easy thing. What it requires is that we are able to be present in the moment and to remain aware of these parts of ourselves, these five centers, to be watching them and to be in charge of them consciously so that when someone comes with gossip, and we hear, oh, this person's been saying these things about you. Instead of letting that flare of fear and anger and hurt pride take control of our mind and our heart and our body, we instead observe that event. And we reflect in ourselves, who cares what they think? Their words don't mean anything unless I give them value. If I give those words no value, then they mean nothing. Why should I let them disturb my peace of mind? Moreover, if they said those things, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I am at fault. Maybe I hurt that person. So you see, instead of becoming angry with them, we become compassionate. We become understanding. We remain at peace. It's a shift in attitude. 
It's a shift in how we transform impressions and we utilize these centers in ourselves. If we're capable of that, we're capable of learning to meditate. In the previous lectures, we've been studying this graphic. This is an image from Tibetan Buddhism. And it illustrates the fundamental steps that one passes through on the way to achieving serenity. The technical state. Again, this isn't something theoretical. It isn't something debatable. It is a, a state of consciousness that anyone can experience if you produce the causes that reach that result. The tradition explains that there are two fundamental ways to prepare oneself for serenity, to begin to reach towards it. And they're quite simple. One is preparation, the other one is practice. So in the previous lectures, I was explaining that the wisdom that we need in order to understand life and understand our problems is reached through a three-step process. The third step is that wisdom itself, which in Sanskrit is called prana, and that means profound knowledge. The step before that, to access that type of wisdom, is called samadhi, which means ecstasy, and that refers to a state of being where your consciousness is not conditioned by anything. It's not conditioned by your body, by any senses, or by any egotistical or psychological defect, like pride or anger or lust. When your consciousness is extracted from all of that, you experience what's called samadhi or ecstasy. It's an experience of absolute liberation, even if it lasts only a moment. It is an unforgettable experience because you see and experience and know your true nature, which is serene. To reach that samadhi, there's the first step of those three, and that's called shila, and it means ethics. Ethics, ecstasy, wisdom. We begin with ethics. Through those ethics, we stabilize our psychological experience so that the consciousness can experience serenity. And from that serenity, we access wisdom. That's all it means. It's simple. So reaching serenity is the key to accessing wisdom. And to reach serenity, the key is ethics. Now I'm mentioning this and pointing it out specifically because this is what the preparation and practice are based on. If we don't begin with this ethical basis, then we will never learn to meditate. And if we've been studying meditation and practicing meditation, and we're failing to actually experience change and advance in our practice, we don't have the right knowledge. If we have the right knowledge, and we're producing the Dharma to be able to receive those results, there's only one more thing that can block us from experiencing reality and meditation, and that's our ethics. If we're not experiencing samadhi and prana in our meditation, those are the reasons why. So we need to examine our practice and understand what is it that's stopping me. This is our fundamental focus. Not chasing an experience, but focusing on what is preventing it. And the vast majority of the time, what's preventing our access to spiritual experience is the state of our psyche some ethical breach, some ethical blind spot, or even something we're doing willingly that we shouldn't be doing. So this is more sp uh, specifically laid out in the first aspect of preparing for meditative serenity, which is the preparation itself. And this is uh, traditionally described as having six aspects. The first one is to have a place to live where we dwell, where we spend our time, that actually supports our motivation, that supports our spiritual life. And that's represented in the graphic. At the very bottom right, you see this temple, and you see the monk, the renunciate, who's beginning the path. So the beginning of the path to reach the state of meditation depends upon having a place that supports it. 
Now, most people read that conducive dwelling, and they only interpret it in the ancient traditional way, which is the way it was applied for thousands of years, which was that the monk, the nun, had to go live in a cave or go live in a monastery in the wilderness and be isolated from society. And the reason that they had to experience that was to isolate them from all their attachments, family, friends, love interests, alcohol, intoxicants, things to crave, things to chase after buying and selling, all the sort of things that happen in society that keep the mind agitated. That was what was implied by conducive dwelling at its most fundamental level. Of course, nowadays, we all live in society. To survive now, we have to. Conducive dwelling is not an easy step to achieve. But we can make steps to improve our environment. So, for example, keeping a very clean house has a big impact on your spiritual well-being, on your psychological well-being. Keeping yourself clean, having a home that has a space where you can practice can really help you. A corner, a room. I know somebody that made their closet into a meditation chamber. As much as we're able, if we can cultivate an environment that supports serenity, the more the better. If in your house you always have the TV on, the radio on, people are smoking, people are doing drugs, people are sleeping around, like if you live in a college dorm, this is going to be very difficult because people in college dorms or in apartment buildings are surrounded by very intense psychological influences, very negative ones that are completely contradictory to achieving serenity. So the effort, the work that's going to be required to overcome that is quite significant. So a person in that circumstance may need to find some place that they can go to take a break, to have peace, to go to a church or a temple or the forest, to sit by a lake, some place where they can go and be isolated from all of that, at least while they attempt to meditate. Conducive dwelling refers to identifying things in our environment that we can change in order to defend ourselves, protect ourselves, and support ourselves in our efforts to meditate. The second aspect is to have little desire. Not getting distracted by all the things that want us to pay attention. To the commercials, to the new products coming out, to the changing of fashion, to all of the the things that our friends are doing and the things that our friends have. We see our friends going on trips and going skiing and going surfing and going here and there and they have a nice car and they have a nice job and we want all those things. And we never question it. So this second aspect is inviting us to question. Why do I want this and that? Why am I chasing after these petty interests all the time? Why is it that I'm letting all these desires for circumstances or for possessions to give me so much discontentment and agitation psychologically? We have so many desires that are influencing us all the time. And most of them are because of envy. We see people on TV and in the magazines who seem to have everything and the advertisers are sure to show us this, that if you get this product, you'll be like these happy people in the commercial. We become influenced by those things and we think we need to dress a certain way, we need to have certain types of possessions, we need to have a certain type of lifestyle to be happy. And it's all lies, all of it. We need to become aware of that. We need to become cognizant of the types of influences that are affecting us all the time that are in truth sucking the life out of us. Why do we need to go buy these products all the time? Why do we need to go shopping all the time? Why are we always chasing after these really insignificant things? We waste so much of our lives on that. And we never stop to really take control of it. So having little desire is about that. And it's related, of course, to the third one, 
to be content with what we have. To recognize that what we have is actually quite exceptional. And to be content with that, take advantage of that. To be content is to be serene. It is to be content with what one has and how one is. Now this is a bit tricky because obviously if we're interested in spirituality, we want to change. We recognize there are things that could be better. We're suffering. And we need to find ways to modify that and change that. So this contentment doesn't mean that we should be complacent with our defects, with our vices, with our mistakes. It means to be content with material things, to be content with our circumstances, to not fight so much against reality. Before we enter spirituality, we're always thinking, oh, I need a better job. I need a better spouse. I need a better car. I need a better house. I need more clothes. I need more money in the bank. And there's all of this discontentment fueled by envy to acquire so many things that we don't have. When we enter spirituality, we maintain the attitude, but we change it for spiritual things. Oh, I don't have the initiations I, ha I need. I don't have the spouse I need. I don't have access to the teachers I need. I don't have time to meditate. I don't have this and that and this and that. It's a long list of things that we think, if we had them, then I could be content. People are always seeking outside for things to fill the gaping wound in their hearts, that spiritual wound. But those things will not satisfy it. No possessions, no circumstances will give us serenity. And one way to transform this aspect of our psychology is whenever we feel that urgency, that stimulation, I need this, I need that, woe is me, my situation is terrible, I don't have these things that I should have, I'm 35 or I'm 40 now and I didn't have kids and I didn't get my education and I don't have the money I should have had, all that stuff, that garbage that we tell ourselves. An easy way to transform that is look around. Look at the facts of the people in life. Look at those people who are suffering far more than you. Open your eyes to the reality. Life is not about fulfilling your desires. Our culture says that's what it's about, but our culture is empty. It has nothing to offer. It only exists to make other people rich. But our culture offers nothing spiritual, nothing lasting. It is like vapor, an illusion. If you want something real, if you want something that will last, abandon desires and become present here and now, content with what you have and focused on taking full advantage of it. When you feel discontent, Look at those who have less. There will always be someone who's suffering more than you and has less than you. Especially all of us in the West, we have no concept of suffering. And yet we think we suffer so much. We are fooling ourselves. Abandon useless activities. We waste so much time and energy on nonsense. Why? When we really understand the fragility of life, the impermanence of the body, and yet the possibility to access something that is real, that is beyond the body, this is an easy step to accomplish. To abandon useless activities. The reality is that all of us will die and we don't know when. And when you really contemplate that and you bring that into your awareness and you really comprehend it, it becomes unthinkable to waste a moment on something stupid. Become very cognizant of the inevitability of your death and know that your state of being at that moment will determine what happens to you after you die.
If you leave your state of being in its current state, your physical body dies, what will happen to you is exactly what happens to you when you fall asleep at night. Do you remember what happens? Are you aware of what happens? Do you wake up the next morning with just some vague memories? That's what will happen to you when you die. You will wake up in some new body in some other place and you won't remember anything, even who you were. You'll be born again depending on your karma, depending on your actions, what you deserve, what you earned. If you want to have control of that process, be aware of that process, you have to change your level of being now so that when you fall asleep at night, you know what's happening to you all night long and you're aware of it. This is not theoretical. It's not a belief. It's being done by people who practice these teachings. People who practice these teachings daily, they lay their body down to sleep. They don't fall asleep. The body does. The consciousness does not. They use that time when the body is sleeping to continue working on themselves, to continue transforming themselves, but not in the physical world, in the dream world. That's here. Malkut, the lowest level, is the physical world. Here is the fifth dimension, the world of dreams. Hod and Netzach. Any religion that you study talks about that. It's in Christianity, it's in Judaism, it's in Buddhism, it's in Hinduism. People nowadays thinks, think it's a joke. It isn't. It's real. Abandon useless activities means instead of wasting time shopping, flipping Facebook for hours on your device, stop doing stupid things like that. Turn your energy and attention to things that are fruitful, that actually have benefit and meaning, not only for yourself but for others. People always complain, I don't know what to do to help other people. I don't know what to do to advance my spiritual life. Look at how you spend your time and change it. Every person who is alive has a lot to offer to help others. Without exception. We have students, one student in particular is coming in my mind. This student is a very young man. He is mentally disabled. He is not easy to deal with. He's very unpredictable. He's tall and muscular and big and very energetic. He's intimidating. But he has enormous compassion. And in spite of his mental condition, invests time and energy, not in being a couch potato watching television or playing video games, but in serving others, helping others. So if he in his condition, with his limitations, can do it, I know everyone else can do it. We have no excuse. So instead of wasting time on useless things, if you invest your time and energy into fruitful action that benefits others, you will receive benefits. Instead of spending your time on selfish things, wasting time, you help others and you in turn receive help. The fifth is the pure ethical discipline. This means that we have to be very true to our conscience. This means that we should never lie, no matter the cost. We should never lie. We should never steal. We should not kill. Now you understand that the great teachers, the great masters have explained that all of these ethics that we learn, the Ten Commandments, the Vinaya, all the different descriptions of how we should behave, we cannot just take those as uh, like a lawyer and look for loopholes. We have to live the spirit of ethics. People who grew up in Christianity here, well, God said you shouldn't fornicate and commit adultery. But it's the modern age. Everybody's doing it, so God will forgive me later. All I have to do is say, I accept Jesus and please forgive me, and God will say, okay, and let me go to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. None of the scriptures of Hinduism and Buddhism, Judaism, none of them say that. Jesus never said that. What the scriptures say is that no adulterer, no murderer, no liar, no thief will go to heaven. And we all have those elements. And we think to ourselves, well, I didn't kill anyone. I didn't commit adultery. But when you comprehend what the teachers say, Jesus himself said, 
Any man who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery with her in his psyche, in his heart, in his mind. That means that all of us are adulterers, that all of us are murderers, that all of us are thieves because we commit those crimes psychologically. And we allow ourselves to do it. So having pure ethical discipline means we work against that. It doesn't matter whether anyone else agrees with us, whether we're going against the entirety of the world. What matters is our inner relationship with divinity. And in my mind is coming this such a beautiful thing that Joan of Arc said. She said, I would rather die than do something that I know is wrong. That's how committed she was to upright ethics, to ethical discipline. And she lived by it. And she transformed Europe with that attitude. We ourselves need to adopt that type of attitude to discover what are real ethics. That's something that's known through your conscience. There are things that we can study to help us. We all have our scriptures. We have the Bible. We have the sutras. We have the tantras. We have the Gita. We have the Mahabharata. We have the Vinaya. We have many scriptures from many traditions that all explain the spirit of the ethical tradition, the ethics that we need to liberate the consciousness from suffering. We just need the will to do it. Most of the specifics about ethical discipline are fairly obvious and are based on statements that we all know, such as treat others as we would wish to be treated. So to be compassionate, to be kind, to be patient, to be loving, There is one instruction in ethical discipline that modern people overlook or avoid, and in some cases may not know about, but it is the instruction that every monk, nun, priest, or yogi receives, which is to be in a state of brahmacharya, or sexual purity. And this instruction is extremely significant. Modern students of meditation overlook this statement and think it only applies to monks or nuns or priests. But in fact, it is the very foundation that stabilizes the consciousness. Our use of sexual energy has tremendous impact on our psyche. Brahmacharya or sexual chastity does not refer to repression or avoidance of sexuality. Instead, it refers to a healthy use of the sexual energy, a use of sexual energy that abandons desire and instead harnesses those forces for spiritual purposes. To facilitate that, the students would receive instructions of different types of exercises in which that energy can be harnessed and transformed, nourishing the free consciousness instead of nourishing lust and pride and envy, greed and gluttony and all the other tendencies that our sexual energy tends to feed when it is not under the guidance of a spiritual discipline. You see, sexual energy is creative, but it is also destructive. A person who's very serious about developing the consciousness and liberating themselves from suffering will utilize the sexual power for that liberation. This means that they must abide by the ethical discipline in the use of sexuality. In synthesis, the ethical discipline of sexuality is to turn that energy towards spiritual development, to free it from its bondage to animal desire, to lust, and instead to make it something pure, something human, something that supports the development and growth of the liberated consciousness. The sixth prerequisite is to stop thoughts of desires or stop thoughts that are driven by desires. And when you really are observant and honest, when you really pay attention to your thoughts and emotions, the impulses that move through your psyche all the time, 
you'll discover that they are strongly driven by all types of attractions to sensations, by cravings for sensations. In short, thoughts, emotions, and, and impulses in the body are rooted in desire most of the time. So this sixth prerequisite to stop thoughts of desires is about transforming that. Instead of being uh, a slave of our thoughts and always being caught up in the constant flow of thinking and thinking and thinking, instead we learn to take control of our psychological experience and to observe the contents of those thoughts and emotions, to become aware of them, to start to notice where are these thoughts coming from? Who is really thinking? What are these feelings really about? Is there a desire that is stimulating this thought or this emotion or this impulse to action? And what does that desire want? Is it compatible with my spiritual longings or is it contradictory? And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll find that most of the thoughts, feelings, and impulses we experience are about gratifying desires gratifying attraction towards sensations, towards circumstances, and really extremely rarely have anything to do with spiritual values. One way to work on this state of psychological conditioning that we have is to flip our point of view. When we find ourselves thinking and feeling and following impulses, that are mechanical, that are animal, that are rooted in desire, we should then reflect on impermanence, reflect on the inevitability of death, reflect on cause and effect. When we feel attracted towards acquiring something, towards having an experience, or we feel attracted towards some person and we can't stop thinking about them, we have to reflect on that attraction, the nature of it. What is it about? What's inside it? Why are we a victim of it? Why is it driving us? Even if we get the thing that we want, we won't have it long. We suffer not having it, then getting it, we might suffer, and then losing it, which we will, we will suffer. So why go through that whole process? Why go through the process of being a victim of craving, a victim of suffering? In this way, we can transform this tendency of constantly thinking about things, having emotions about things, having impulses to get things and experience things. Obviously, to do this, you have to be self-aware. You have to be self-observant. You have to be watching your mind, your intellect, your feelings, your heart, and your body. You have to be vigilant, observing, mindful. And in that process of developing mindfulness, vigilance, you are developing concentration and meditative serenity. You are developing your skills for meditation. But what you're also developing is the ability to recognize the difference between you and your thoughts. The essential point of all of these prerequisites is to modify our behaviors so that we are no longer disrupting our psyche so that our actions, our thoughts and feelings and the ways we use our body, instead of causing more disturbances psychologically, they instead lead towards serenity, peacefulness. By abandoning bad behaviors, bad ways of thinking, harmful emotions and harmful actions with the body, the mind naturally steadies the psyche naturally comes to a calm state. So what this means is that the reason that our minds are disturbed, are unsettled, and we cannot concentrate and we cannot relax, it's all because of our behaviors. If we apply these prerequisites, these changes to our behaviors, physically and psychologically, serenity is the natural outcome. This is simple cause and effect. Let me emphasize again that the basis of all of that change 
is energetic. It is the energy that feeds our actions. And the most powerful energy that we have in us is the sexual energy. We can do all of the ethical changes. We can meditate for hours every day. But if we are not working with the sexual energy in an upright way, we will never learn true serenity. The sexual energy has the greatest power to disturb the mind, the heart, and the body. Conversely, it is also the greatest power to create serenity in the mind, heart, and body. So all that was just the first aspect of preparing for serenity. And if you observe them and you practice them, you see that they are about changing the things that cause discontentment in us, that cause anxiety, that cause pain, that cause anger and envy and pride and lust and all the other qualities that are the opposite of serenity. If we want serenity in meditation, if we want to enter this path and stabilize our psyche so that it can reflect reality, so that we can acquire wisdom, we need to stop behaving in the ways that contradict it. Notice, recognize the behaviors that you perform that cause you to not have serenity and change them. Are you envious? Are you discontent? Are you stressed? Are you anxious? Are you lustful? Are you angry? Transform that. Most of us think, I will be content if I can move, if I can get out of my town, my city, my apartment, if I can find a girlfriend or a boyfriend, if I can get a better job. We all think that these external things will give us contentment. They won't. Every external circumstance will just create new problems for us. That's it. Some old ones will become less severe and some new ones will become more severe and we will be in the exact same problem. The discontentment is not caused by external things. It's caused by our psyche. So these six in summary are about learning this new attitude, learning to transform, find contentment in the moment, being conscious of oneself, being relaxed, not letting desires and discontentment be in charge of our psychological experience, but instead to have our willpower focused on the moment, open, not craving, not avoiding, perceiving reality, observing the facts, seeing things for how they are and dealing with it. Very practical. Feet on the ground, not our head in the clouds, not dreaming about nirvana or heaven, not fantasizing about being a spiritual person, being in the moment and living life with full attention, full awareness, the full power of our ability to perceive, receiving that information, transforming it. We're talking about something that's very energetic very conscious. If we can start that process, then we're performing what we call self-observation. Self-observation is the moment-to-moment -moment continuity of awareness of ourselves. And not simply just a casual awareness, but an active observation, looking at the facts, relaxing, observing continually. Relaxing is a key element here. You can see that when our dwelling, when our home is a place of chaos, we're always annoyed, we're always bothered, it makes us stressed, we can't relax. When we have a lot of desires, we're always stressed, we can't relax. When we're not content, we're always stressed, we can't relax. When we're full of all kinds of activities, we're very stressed. We're not relaxed. We don't have good ethics. We're lying. We're fornicating. We're committing adultery. We're cheating. We're not being honest. We're anxious. We have a lot of uncertainty. 
What's happening with our finances? There's so many things. What about the election? What about the president? What about the war? All of this intense information that's flowing into us all the time, making us very tense, very stressed, very chaotic. All because we are not transforming it. That's a choice. We choose. If we shift our attitude, we change the things we can change in our environment. Maybe there is something we can do to improve our home. Maybe we can change our behaviors, our attitudes, the activities we're involved in. Maybe we can cut out some things that we don't need to be doing. But most of all, we need to learn to change our moment to moment experience. Be present and observing facts and relax. This relaxation is to relax the whole body all the time. Anytime you can remember it, whatever you're doing, you're at work, you're driving your car, you're at home, you're washing dishes, you're doing laundry. You become aware of yourself. Wow. Why am I tense? I'm just doing laundry. Why is my mind racing when I'm just doing laundry? Relax. Be fully present. No need to think about tomorrow or yesterday. Look at what you're doing and do that. Set everything else aside. Breathe. Relax. Observe. Keep that continual from action to action. When you're at work, you're dealing with your employer, you're dealing with the people that you serve, you have to apply the same principle. Notice that when you go into conversation, you become very tense. You start to act in different ways to impress people, to please people, to influence their attitude towards you. Why? Why not just be relaxed and be yourself? Why not just be honest? Why not just be content and not be concerned whether they like you or not praise you or blame you. If you are honest, you are yourself. You can be strong in that. But if you're lying, if you're deceiving, if you're not acting like yourself, if you're acting like someone else, of course, you're going to be anxious because you're not being genuine, simple things, but that have a big impact on the psyche. Now, all of that cumulative action throughout the day is what is producing your experience of life. So if you are experiencing discontentment and anxiety and stress, you are the one creating it. If you can change that, your attitude, learn to observe and learn to relax all the time, everything else will change. There is a fundamental principle a law of nature. If you change internally, everything outside of you will change too. That is a law of nature. It is not a theory and you can prove it. Observe people, observe the person, someone that you may have known for a long time who suddenly starts drinking, smoking, sleeping around, becomes an addict, becomes a liar and a thief and observe how their life goes into the toilet and observe another person who was bad and did bad things, but changed, gave up the addictions, gave up the dishonesty and see how their life improves. These are laws of nature. It's observable. It is factual. It is provable. Let us live it by it ourselves. Choose the superior action and you will receive the superior result. All of that is concerned with our daily lives. In our daily lives, we are establishing a psychological environment. Make that clear for yourself. All of this, how you engage with the world is creating an environment for your psyche. And if you're behaving in a superior way, in a proper way, that environment becomes conducive for meditation. Only in that environment can meditation happen. Someone who is an addict 
to drugs, to alcohol, to sex, to money, to praise, all the things that we can be addicted to, that person will never learn to meditate until they conquer the addiction. Any type of activity or behavior that produces discontentment, disequilibrium, anger, pain, anxiety, all of those qualities that contradict serenity prevent it. They prevent meditation. Meditation happens when the psyche is calm, serene. When you see people talking about a spiritual life and they're encouraging drug use, alcohol use, abuse of sex, lots of money involved, they're lying. Once you create that psychological environment, you get to the actual practice of meditation. And this has two aspects, an effective posture and an effective practice. Now, if in your daily life, your psychological attitude is one that is out of control, where you're not cultivating relaxation and peacefulness, then when you try to meditate, you won't be relaxed. You'll come home from your crazy day, stressed out, anxious, angry, upset, and want to meditate. It will be very difficult. You may sit and you may attempt to meditate, but it can take a long time for you to come down out of all that intensity. So you can see how it makes sense to have your daily life cultivating that serenity before you practice meditation. Because then once you come to your meditation, you've been relaxed all day, meditation becomes easy. You've already set the stage. Your body is ready, your mind is ready, your heart is ready. Effective posture primarily means that you are relaxed. This is the most significant thing. Completely, fully relaxed. Not just physically, mentally and emotionally as well. In traditional meditation uh, lineages, there are specific postures that are recommended that are all very good. There's the traditional lotus posture or half lotus posture that most people associate with meditation for a reason. It is an extremely effective foundation for meditation practice, but it is not the only one. You can sit Japanese style with your legs folded under you. You can sit in a chair, hands on your knees, feet on the floor, back straight. These three basic postures are the best for beginners. To have your spine straight, your head upright, your body relaxed. The reason you want to be upright as a beginner is so that you don't fall asleep. As a beginner, you're learning to relax the body, to bring it down from that intensity of stress and chasing desires to a state of contentment. But the way we're accustomed nowadays, when we sit down to relax, we lay down to relax, we zoom straight to sleep. You don't want to fall asleep. You want to maintain a posture where you can be relaxed, but wakeful. Wakefulness means that you maintain awareness of yourself and what you're doing. Sometimes we use the word drowsiness to talk about meditation practice. Some lineages condemn drowsiness. They say you should not be drowsy. What they're saying is that you shouldn't be falling asleep, losing awareness of yourself. What we mean by drowsiness is that the body is so well relaxed that you don't have to pay attention to it. The same way that it gets when you're going to take a nap or you're going to go to sleep. The body just becomes very still. That is the best position to be in for meditation. What we want in our meditation practice is to be able to forget the body, to place it in that position and leave it there still, perfectly still. 
Because our goal, as we explained in the previous lectures, is to extract out of the physical body. Remember, Malkut represents physicality. Each of these spheres above represent other aspects of our energetic and psychological experience. We have energy, emotion, thought, will. We want to relax out of all of those conditioning factors. You can't do that if your physical body is uncomfortable, in pain, and bothering you. So we need to be able to put the body in a position where it can rest and be content, and be still. For that, we need relaxation. Effective practice requires two components, mindfulness and vigilance. And these are represented by the implements that this monk carries. Mindfulness and vigilance. In its most basic form, mindfulness means we remain aware of what we're doing. When you're washing the dishes, do you remain aware of washing the dishes? If you're honest, you'll say no. Because most of us, when we wash the dishes, we're thinking of something else. We do the dishes mechanically. We're not really paying attention to it. We're listening to the radio, or thinking about work, or thinking about that attractive person that we saw, or that product we want to go buy on the internet. We're remembering the problems we had that day, or the problems we're facing tomorrow. And we're washing the dishes without awareness of our body. That is a lack of mindfulness. That means that that will be an obstacle for meditation. To be able to meditate, you need mindfulness. Very strong. This means that your attention is not distracted from what you're concentrating on. When we begin the process of developing meditative serenity, we learn to place consciousness on one thing and hold it. And take attention away from everything else. So one common and basic practice that we use is to observe the breath. To look at the sensations of breathing as they happen, without changing them, and to keep our attention on that. Mindfulness is like this rope between where consciousness comes from to what it is observing. It's a rope that connects us. I am aware of observing my breath, and that awareness of what one is doing is mindfulness. That is what we want to sharpen. And we can develop that all day long in all of our activities. When you're driving your car, drive and be aware of what you're doing and observe the continuity of that awareness. And notice when you get distracted, you bring it back and you remain continually aware of what you're doing. And in that way, you're developing your meditation practice while you're driving, while you're walking, while you're washing dishes, while you're working. So your life becomes nourishment for your spiritual development. The hook that he has in his other hand is vigilance. And that's used to watch for when we get distracted. So you're doing something. Let's say you're meditating, you're observing your breath. But then you become aware that these thoughts started happening and you start thinking about that TV show and gosh, that was funny when such and such did this and they said this and ha, 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 ha. Then you catch yourself, I'm not paying attention. That's vigilance. And you return your attention back to that object, to being mindful. These are two significant tools. When you first learn to meditate, it will feel to you like you can't do either one. We'll give you the instruction, everybody will relax, you'll take a posture and I'll say, okay now, observe your breath. Don't pay attention to anything else. Put 100% attention on the sensations of breathing. And you'll start to watch it for five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And then you're remembering that episode of some TV show you saw when you were a kid and it was so funny. And then 20 minutes goes by and I say, okay, we're done. And you say, wait a minute. All I did is think about TV. It seems frustrating. That experience shows you how little mindfulness, how little vigilance you have and how much work you need to do. It's a painful experience, but a beautiful one. Because it is the initial moment when you realize, wow, this is real. I can change it. 
You change it through your daily activities and you change it by practicing every day. Little by little, they get better. You get stronger. You're able to maintain mindfulness of what you're doing for longer periods. And your vigilance is there waiting to see if you get distracted, to catch yourself and bring yourself back to focusing on the object of meditation. So I just described for you the first two stages that are illustrated on this graphic. The first two are at the bottom. The very bottom one is the first stage. It shows the monk chasing the elephant and the monkey. The elephant represents the dullness and the heaviness of the mind, which is out of control, being pulled along by the monkey who's always distracted and always curious, always browsing the internet, always going on Facebook, always going here, going there, interested in this, interested in that, always running away from the truth. And we as the spiritual person, the consciousness who wants to change, we have to chase these animals in our mind. To do it, we need the rope and the hook. So through our daily lives and also through our daily practice of concentration, we need to learn to settle the psyche by withdrawing attention from everything else and direct it towards a single focus. This is stage one. Every Buddha, every angel, every master who ever learned to become that started here. Step one, settle the mind, settle the psyche. Focus attention on one thing, keep it there. It isn't easy. That's what this fire represents, the intensity of effort that it takes, the amount of energy it takes to keep doing this again and again. The Buddha Shakyamuni said, if in your practice your mind wanders a thousand times and you return it a thousand times, that was a beautiful meditation. Key is to catch when we're distracted and bring our attention back to the object that we're observing. This has to be a continual daily effort. Every day, without exception. That's what starts the process of change. If you do this once a week, you'll never get anywhere. You'll give up. But if you work on this every day, the best you can, you will find change. You will. It's inevitable. It's scientific. And it has these two components. Your daily experience all day, being mindful, being present and relaxing, observing what you're doing, not being distracted, being there doing what you're doing. And then every day also take 10 minutes or 20 minutes to sit down, shut down all of your senses and focus your concentration on one thing. That one thing can be whatever you want, but don't change it. The breath is the simplest. You always have it with you. Just observe the senses of the breath in your nostrils. Don't change your breathing. Don't modify it. Just observe it. If you want to really take it seriously, it's harder, but more effective. Observe a sacred object, a statue or an image, let's say of uh, Jesus or Buddha or some deity. Memorize it and use that as your object of focus. Close your eyes and visualize it. This is harder, but it bears a lot of fruit. But you have to do it every day. 10 minutes, take a break. Do another 10 minutes, take a break. Do another 10 minutes, take a break. So that's the first stage, focusing attention, withdrawing it from everything else. As you do that seriously, you'll reach the second stage. And this is where you are looking towards developing more continuity. The second stage just says, settling continually involves the attention that was directed initially to continue focusing without becoming distracted by anything else. In the first stage, you're learning to place attention on the one thing. In the second stage, you're constantly bringing it back to that. So they sound very similar. The difference is in the second stage, you see the white on the animals? That white is serenity. 
concentration, settling. It's where the psyche is starting to become a little different. Instead of being wild all the time, you have these moments where you taste peace. It could be at any time. It could be during the day. It can be during your meditation practice, but you start to notice it. Little moments where, oh, wow, I actually feel relaxed and I feel mindful and I feel a little bit concentrated. It's a beautiful thing to start to see that fruit. The exercises are the same as the previous lecture. Put these things into practice. Observe yourself every day. Perform your meditative concentration every day and record the facts of it in a spiritual diary. This is how you become accountable to yourself. Become honest with yourself. The diary is not for anyone else to look at. It's for you. And it can be as simple or as involved as you want it to be. But at the very minimum, start recording. Today I made effort. Today I learned this. Today I practiced for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Start recording these facts about your spiritual work. And little by little, you'll start to see it gives you insight. A lot of insight. Some of it's painful. But when you recognize and discover those places of pain, you can deal with them and they will go away. If you don't see them and don't deal with them, the pain will still be there. So it's better to learn about them and deal with them. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.